Hello and welcome to the LSE Day Trippers Women Show Special with me, Chris Brack, and Emma Sanders is back again. You're like a regular now, Emma, aren't you? And we oh, just yeah. like, oh, <laughs> Lipple got promoted. Hey! <laughs> finally, finally, I can I can be relaxed now. I can stop stressing everyone out with me on the edge of my tether because it's I've been annoying everyone for weeks. I must, be, <laughs> I, must, I must admit, I think Gab's quite glad now it's done because I've been annoying, annoying everyone. So... <laughs> But you, you were like me, you were lucky to go. Good, wasn't it? Yeah, it was really good. It was uh, just a really good day, to be honest. I think it's one of those days where like, it's a proper away trip, isn't it? Mm. It's literally like the other end of the country. So, you know, just things like the car journeys are really fun. Like it was excitement and obviously a little bit of anxiety going down. And then on the way up, it was just, you know, constant singing. And uh, on the way back, sorry, it's just constant singing and sort of celebrating and stuff. And yeah, it was just such a good day. And I think it was one of those where it was going to happen at some point, but if Liverpool hadn't have got the job done against Bristol, then, well, you would have had a heart attack by now. Oh, yeah. Two, also... Imagine me, imagine me two, two weeks happens <laughs> away. So, no, no. Exactly. Well, well, that's it. You know, it, it would have, you would, players would have then gone into the, into the international break. Even, you know, even Beardy said that he was a little bit sort of, on edge about not getting the job done against Bristol and knowing that they then would have had to have waited for over two weeks. So, um, yeah, just to get the job done there and then, and then it meant that they can just sort of go off an international break, have a proper switch off from all the pressure and expectation and just come back for the last two games and the trophy lift sort of being able to enjoy it. So, yeah, perfect, really. Yeah, the only ones I felt sorry for, I felt sorry for uh, Fernie, Kerry and uh, Raza because they, they all literally, as soon as the game was over... Uh, they only got to celebrate for half an hour and it's like right I've got to get a flight or I've got to go yeah. to Cardiff so it's a bit yeah. like I've just, don't get me wrong I'm sure they still celebrate it but you know I think they're all they're all on the build up for two weeks time for the trophy lift I'm sure that'll be a, yeah. a fun get a fun day for everyone but um but yeah it was a perfect day it was like it was baking it was and yeah. to be fair, Brist, Brist City is a lovely ground as well yeah. massive yeah. nice nice and spacious we had uh, the lady from Miss Kick there didn't we so that was cool for yeah. all the kids uh, the world's scariest mascot <laughs> Genuinely, if you've not seen if you're not seeing Google Bristol City's mascot, it's the scariest looking mascot I've ever seen in my life. I thought it was a, it's like a traffic cone for a nose. It doesn't look like a bird. I don't know what it is, but it it's the scariest looking mascot I've ever seen. It's really intimidating. Speaking of birds, they were attacking us in the post match interviews. They were like launching the biggest piles of bird poo I think I've ever seen in my life. And I had to put my hood up when I was interviewing the players because I swear one missed Kerry Holland by about an inch. And I even Aww. even Beardy was like, I'm getting out of here because these seagulls are just they were going everywhere. So yeah, we <laughs> clearly almost Bristol. didn't make it out with our with our lives, to be honest. But yeah, yeah. they were clearly Bristol fans, weren't they? But um yeah. so the team got announced and it was um a bit unusual because we had um we had Taylor Hines, who's been brilliant for us this year, left uh, at left wing back, switched to the right wing back, which to be honest, was everyone's like, it's a bit unusual. Now I did wonder if it was a combination of injuries and whether he's just trying to get as many of his informed players on the pitch because he couldn't drop Meg Campbell because she's been in good form and all the back three, I mean, you want all of them in really good form. So I just wonder if it was almost like put you on the left. But I mean, she, looking at the stats from Anfield Analytics, um, she got an awful lot of the ball cutting inside. Mm. That's it. So you do wonder if it was a tactic to just overload them in the middle. Yeah, I think it was probably a bit of both. I think, yeah, like you said, that there was players in form, but also I think there was areas to exploit for Bristol um, in, in the full-back areas, which I think Beardy must have identified beforehand and thought that if we can if we can use those areas where they almost kind of, they bring they sometimes bring kind of two players and overload in terms of defending, like they back up in the, in the kind of full-back positions, which does leave space in the middle. And I think with... Leanne Kernan and Katie Stengel, you've got players who are going to draw defenders out wide and therefore they kind of leave that space in the middle for the likes of sort of Taylor Hines to cut in, cut inside too. So I think it actually worked really well in the end. I thought mm. Razzle Roberts was probably Liverpool's best player in the first half, certainly up there anyway, alongside maybe Ke Kerry Holland in, in the first half, where I think Razzle pushed forward a lot and then also had the pace to sort of provide that emergency cover when Bristol City, I think they did have was it at least one, if not two, sort of chances on the break in the first half where they they were able to sort of get in behind out wide. But our full-backs kind of 
they've got the pace and, and the awareness almost to recover in those positions. So I think that might have been behind the thinking to it as well. But yeah, I thought thought it worked. It did the job. I don't think it was brilliant. Um, I don't think I actually don't think Liverpool's performance on the day was particularly great. Um, I think the players worked hard, um, probably lacking a little bit of quality and a little bit of um, composure, I'd say, in some parts, certainly in the first half, towards the end of the first half. Um, and obviously in that period in the second half where sort of Bristol City tried to fight back a little bit. But yeah, no, I, I think it worked. And yeah, he got the experienced players on the pitch, got them to sort of control the game. And um, yeah, they just needed, well, they just needed a draw. Um, but yeah, they kept, just needed a win, really. I kept forgetting that bit. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, I was getting really stressed. I think Philip Swall just thought it was hilarious watching my stress levels go up and down, up and down. I I've don't believe admit, that you were stressed at any point in that game. I was <laughs> I was absolutely on my knees at one point. I generally well, I had, I had my eight year old daughter who was a lot calmer than me. She was she was just bouncing around thinking it was this is the best day ever. She thinks this is what happens all the time. So I was like <laughs> So but I mean listen, this perfect start, you know, Meg Campbell's, you know, ridiculously accurate long throw, which just caused chaos. Absolute yeah. chaos. Yeah. Uh it's a smart finish by Nephi. Just to get out of her feet, and when you see it on inside, um, Bristol is Liverpool power. Is that is you don't realize it's actually in off the post. You know, mm. They can't mm. couldn't put it any better. And it was quite poignant. The captain captain's goal. You know, Fahey doesn't get many goals, but they do tend to be important when she gets them. So I must admit yeah. that settled me and probably everybody else <laughs> down. Got right, perfect start. And twelve seconds later, it's 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 one one. Which yeah. I must have was oh, oh, I could have done. I could have done at least a couple of minutes of enjoying the goal because literally we're still celebrating the goal as they crossed. Yeah. As let's be honest, she crossed it, and it was a bit Paul Koncheski in the FA Cup final. It was definitely a cross, and as soon as she crossed it, you were like, "Oh, it's floating in that," and she doesn't yeah. mean it either. It's because it, to be fair, it takes a lot to beat Lawsy. I mean, I think that's the first I think Lawsy's conceded two in the league because mm. it. I think yeah. the only time we've conceded two in the league, uh, to be fair, she wasn't even playing. Yeah. So, yeah. so I could have, I could have done, could have done about that. But then, to be fair, to Megan Campbell, you couldn't keep her out of the action. Uh, it was her free kick drifted in, which um, again caused chaos. And Jazz Matthews, which is a smart finish from a centre back, centre backs know how to shoot. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so, but I mean, to be fair, be- just before we scored, um, they were cleaned through Bristol, and again. Rachel Laws does what Rachel Laws does. She just makes herself big and makes big saves. And they're always at Chris Sand, they're always nil nils, one ones. That's where Rachel Laws comes into her own. Uh, and look, she just she calms it for that. I mean, to be fair, Rachel Laws' goal celebration should just be a meme on their own because they're brilliant. <laughs> uh, the one when we go to once, you I've never seen a keep up berserk like that in ages. I think Alison could learn a thing or two about how to celebrate a goal. It was great. Yeah, so, although Laws could also learn how to how to score a goal like Alison. So if if they take bits from each other, then we'll, we'll, we'll put that to, we'll put that to her. Then maybe she should try and score a goal. I'm not sure how she'll yeah. take that. To be fair, get up I'll on and make a throw in. Yeah, I'll get you to bring that up in the next interview with her. I'll do it. Yeah. <laughs> cool. But look, half time, it was well wasn't going. You know, look, two and up away from home. You know, there was about well, I think it was about nearly 100 Liverpool fans came down on coaches, and then there was a, a good. Good bunch of us who came down in cars as well. So it must be 150, mm. 200 Liverpool fans there in a crowd of 5,700. And they made the presence known. They knew yeah. Liverpool were there and Liverpool were making it known. Because to be fair, Bristol were, I think, a little bit overall by the occasion, crowd wise, because Mega Campbell's throws or the speed that we were running at, you could see they were like, we don't see this very often. And Bristol were a very good side. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think I think the first, the first half sort of epitomized, I guess, the mentality and perhaps the the nervousness from both sides, really. Um, Liverpool went there and, you know, it was quite quite clear from first minute that they, they wanted to go out and get the job done early so that they, you know, didn't have to worry about it. And they did that. They started absolutely on fire. Um, they were all over Bristol City, causing problems, got the goal, and then they almost went the complete other way and thought, oh, well, that's, you know, we've kind of got the goal that we needed now. And uh, mm. I think sort of the lights... Or came up in their eyes and they thought, oh, this is it. You know, we're almost there. And sort of switched off. Um, they always say, you know, you're most dangerous just after scoring. And that's exactly what happened. Because I think while Liverpool then switched off for a brief second, Bristol 
City sort of realised that, you know, that this was their, their only chance, you know, they were going to be out of the title race. So they needed to they needed to respond and they did that immediately. And I think that then obviously not to Liverpool's confidence, made them a little bit nervous. So all those emotions sort of came out in the first 45 minutes. And at the same time, Bristol went through, you know, the kind of the nervousness of the occasion, um, realising that, that they had to respond and sort of dug in because they had that motivation of almost being behind and having nothing to lose, really, to then obviously going behind again at, just before the break. And then I guess in the second half, it was Liverpool, I think, kind of came to terms with the pressure and the expectation because they've been probably more used to it than Bristol City this season. Um and I think they just eventually settled down. And once it went 3-1, look, even if Bristol were going to score again, I think it was just you felt like they, were, they weren't going to get three. And that's what obviously they needed at that point. And um, yeah, but when Bo Kearns then came on and, and netted the fourth, it was, yeah, it was game over really. But yeah, it was it, it was difficult. It was a, yeah, it was a, it was a hard, a hard working game. Um, but yeah. They've just got the job done. And like I say, I think each team experienced every emotion and probably all the fans as well. I know, because you're losing the camera on me. Uh, I mean, to be fair, third goal, uh, to be honest, Liverpool could easily have had two before the the event you got the third. Uh, Big throw from uh, Meg Campbell. Brock Downey fell to Katie Stengel, who's seven got Since we signed her in January, that's her seventh goal. Yeah. She's just been immense talent. And her link-up play and her hold-up play was brilliant because she took some battery because uh, yeah. they're a very physical side Bristol and her link play was really good and she's just really good at crucial goals you know I think you know her first goal what the Watford 1-0 that's just what she does and you know the emotions look I think we all thought that that's it 3-1 I think the crowd was singing it we're all going for it going that's us going up that it's yeah. done the, you yeah. can tell but the goal celebration was different for that one it, there was a euphoria around that one I was like that's it yeah and then Abby Harrison does what Abby Harrison does for Bristol City and annoyingly scored, <laughs> which, I could, which I really could have done when I was at 3-2. I really didn't want that. Oh, you weren't nervous then still, were you? I was nervous then because ah. I, I don't know what it is. I think the last couple of years of the women, I've just been like the eternal pessimist going, <laughs> oh, no, I just don't need this in my life. But to be fair, this way I think you saw the strength and depth for Liverpool because you brought mm-hmm. on um, Jay Bailey, who did really well when she came on, probably should have scored. Uh, you saw the class of Carla Humphrey who came on again, was unlucky not to score. But just everything about it, look at Missy Bow, probably poignant. You know, the young scouts yeah. in the team gets the goal. Slightly fortunate, we would say, if we know we can say it. Um, do we think Stenjo's it it, St- little run cut back from the byline? Oh. <laughs> I think, I think, VAR, I think, VAR wise, I'm not sure if that was quite, over, I think I might have been over the line, but listen, sometimes you get that bit of luck. Let's face it. Oh, 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 did it? What? As in, like you thought it'd run out of play with Sten- Stenjo? Yeah, there's a the few images that are going around thinking. Oh, is there? Yeah, uh, it yeah. might just be. Out. But yeah. listen, I'll be honest. The time the goal was that late in the game, I don't. It 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 how can I put it? It's not a game changing goal because the game's yeah. done then. And listen, then full time. Um, one of the young kids who sat next to Olivia, they had a ready made cardboard trophy. So it yeah. was quite cool watching the kids get to the front to, to see Nifa. He lift the cardboard trophy. It was actually quite quite a nice point. You bet getting all the kids in front and all that. And it was a nice experience uh, in front of my yeah. daughter, you know, because it's not a thing you get to experience very often. Uh, and I, look, I, this is not me being hyperbole. That's up there with the men winning the league for me. Oh, Emotionally, yeah. that, that's yeah. really up there because the last five years have been, it's not been the easiest time following Liverpool at times, you know, things on and off the pitch haven't been easy, so it's nice to have some joy, and there is that nice bond and connection which has always been there, but it just feels special this year, because you get to know the players you know, the hardships going, you know the sad things that have happened with Riley Foster, and the assistant manager with uh, Matt Beard so that, it, you know, all those little, little stories, you know, Ash Hodson's been there just since day, since day one, pretty much you know, she's seen the highs and the lows you sort of get those little stories and it is quite nice to see them. So, you know, it, it was great for old fans and new fans. So there's nothing better than watching a team win the winner league in person. As good as yeah. it's going to be in three weeks, Sam, being there for the moment is what you want. Yeah, I mean, I, I wrote a feature that, well, I actually wrote it at um, between midnight and 1am and then 6am and 7am the next morning. 
Um, so yeah. Um, but yeah, sort of while I was writing it, I was it was all kind of about Liverpool's journey and and how they sort of you know gone through all these hard times and like you say a few of those incidents that, that this season as well. Um, and obviously, I was listening back to the interviews with with a couple of players and, and Matt Beard and sort of listening to kind of the emotion of it all. And um, yeah, I definitely sort of went through all those emotions myself, thinking back to the to the kind of you know the journey that they've been on and. And how far they they almost dropped from the heights, really. You know, you forget that Liverpool were back to back WSL winners in 2013 and 2014, obviously under Matt Beard. And then kind of a lot has changed since then. It's it's only been eight years since then. And you look at at how far women's football has grown with with Liverpool not at the heights of it. Um and sort of when you were when I was reflecting on on all that, it was quite emotional, really, sort of coming round and almost feeling like it was coming full circle, like this feels like the start of a kind of a new generation and hopefully the start of a new era where Liverpool can almost build from scratch again and just go back to the beginning and almost sort of build a new a new history with, with women's football in what is going in its its own sort of hist- new history. So, um, yeah, look, it's a wonderful day to be a part of and who knows what this could be the start of hopefully you know it's not just Liverpool getting getting promotion this year and then being back in the WSL hopefully it's them sort of starting the the road to to more successes in the WSL and building upon it and who knows in another eight years whether that might be success at at the top of the WSL as opposed to you know the the championship so yeah exciting times and yeah like I say a really good day just to be a part of. Yeah because this is you know, ultimately in the plan for Liverpool, this is this is stage one. Stage one was get out mm-hmm. the championship. That's done. Stage two is establish yourself in WSL. But the ultimate aim for Liverpool should always be challenging for the title both in England but also on the continent. You know, mm-hmm. Liverpool need to get themselves back into challenge for European honours and being in the WSL. Now that's not going to happen overnight. That's a long project. But yeah. that should be the aim of the club. That should always be the aim, the end focus. And yeah. these are the big milestones you want on the way. I mean, Matt Beard, to be, you know, deserves a lot of credit because, let's be fair, there was when he came in, there was an expectation when he joins in, which is Matt Beard's an established WSL level manager. You know, he's he's done well in America as well with uh, Boston Breakers. So, my expectation was, well, if he's coming down to the championship, he's not coming to the championship for long. He wants yeah. to be here. He wants to be up in, a, in the season. He's obviously had certain promises made to him. So, he actually came under a bit of pressure, which is, we. Ex- and everyone did, you expect to go up. And yeah. he, uh, to be fair to him, he handled that pressure for uh, outwardly. Look, I don't know the man well enough, but outwardly, he didn't show it really. Yeah. You know, he was very calm when the start wasn't what we wanted. You know, I think it was one win, one draw, one loss, a bit of an indifferent start. But then he didn't get overly excited when we, you know, we've basically got 19 games un- unde- undefeated for the rest of the season. And he's that level of calmness. Um, just shows up just how on which for quality managers and you just see he's just just brought players on you know took players onto a slightly higher higher level and i think every sign he's brought in has had a real positive impact on the club yeah i mean like he he is he is a cool guy he is he doesn't really get nervous about stuff his personality is quite laid back um he's a bit of a joker and uh he puts on a bit of a serious face when he's when he's at the football but yeah he 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 is a bit of a joker so he doesn't really get caught up in in these things. He he does. I think he's a classic Londoner where he just thinks very practically, and he goes, "Well, what's the point of stressing about what might or might not happen?" And he he he, he speaks in cliche sometimes, which I tell him off for because it drives me crazy. But when he says, "You know, we take each game at a time," like he does genuinely mean it because he is the type of manager that just I don't think he has the headspace really to look that far ahead. He just doesn't really think about it. So. Um, he was kind of the perfect person for the situation that Liverpool have almost found themselves in this season where from day one that they've had the expectation, like you say, to go straight back up. They've been the team that's been chased all season. So, yeah, he, I think his sort of calm personality and the way that he approaches games reflected on onto his players. Um, he brought, like you say, he brought in some signings that he knew and he trusted and he kind of knew what he was going to get from them and yeah, there was a lot of a lot of changes in the summer. Their preseason was massively disrupted due to COVID. You know, Beardy himself um, had issues with COVID with you know himself and his family. So 
they didn't really have much time to work together at, at the beginning of the season. And that first month, I think, was really difficult. Obviously, Liverpool lost lost the first game, um, the only game that they did lose so far. So, um, you know, on the way to winning the title. So it was a difficult start, but then they almost, once they kind of found their feet and he knew that he could rely on those players that he brought in, the experience of, you know, the likes of Jazz Matthews and Meg Campbell, for example, even though she was out injured, she still had that experience in the dressing room. Then obviously getting sort of Fernie back to kind of her full fitness as well as, as one, of the, one of the main players in terms of that kind of leadership role within the squad. I think, yeah, I think when then all of that started kicking together, it yeah, it started coming through really. And yeah, I think he's done a fantastic job and he does deserve a lot of credit. And I know that he's already been planning for next season. You know, I spoke to him exclusively back in January for a long, a long piece then and um, sort of did a, a big interview with them, with, with him then. And um, yeah, it was quite obvious that he already had plans in place, but I don't think he wanted to talk too much about it. And then he, you know, he said the same thing the other day. He said, look, we've got three, five year plans. Um, but yeah, look, the club have got, they've got things in place. They've got plans to build new training facilities. They've got recruitment plans. They've got a structure in place in terms of, you know, aims and ambitions on the pitch and it is like you say it's all about sort of consolidating their position in the WSL first and then it's about climbing up the table and and challenging for for silverware so yeah they've got it all all planned out um but there will obviously be bumps along the road now because they've kind of got through the easy bit um which as you say was, was stage one um so yeah I think it's it's just worth remembering that I guess yeah, cause next year is going to be a challenge. I mean, the other exciting thing is Liverpool have got a young squad. Yeah, they've got a mm-hmm. lot of exciting youngsters, which Matt Beard, to his credit, has also developed. Uh, we had Charlotte Wardler on loan, who's just got better and better every game you've seen that. I mean, listen, Liverpool will be hoping to God they could sign her, but we'll have to see if that happens. Taylor Hines, been brilliant all season. Missy Bow, uh, And then we've got youngsters like uh, Hannah Silcock, who just looks brilliant. I mean, she just mm. looks a real classy young centre half that we've got coming through. So it's a nice mix. Uh, and to be fair, there have been players who you would probably like, who probably would have expected a bit more game time than they unfortunately got because the system yeah. changes, injuries, it happens. Don't hear any murmurs coming out of the club, though, which is generally the sign of a happy camp, which is no one's happy not to play, but they all accept they've got their role in the side, which is a, a real positive to see. So, from your point of view, then, who's who, what's been sort of like your big games, key games to getting us promoted? Yeah, so I think I actually voted on this um, in one of the fan um, accounts sort of end of season awards. And I said that I felt the, the Durham away game was was really was really important just because that was, um, I think that was the one that we won 2-0. Um, mm. And I that, think I feel like... You'll make, you'll make set the tone in the first 30 seconds. Yeah, where Fernie absolutely crunched into them. <laughs> well, that's one of the reasons. Um, but yeah, it's it, but that's kind of the prime example, really. I guess is that last season that was um, that was the game that kind of Liverpool struggled with was the physicality. You know, they struggled dropping down to the Championship and almost didn't really know how to play that kind of football. And the I guess the contrast between that two 0 win away to Durham. Um, and the one and and the kind of the games against Durham last season was just so so vast in that Liverpool had clearly um, learned from that and developed from that and they didn't shy away from the physical challenge and you know as you say sort of Fernie made it quite clear from the first couple of seconds of kickoff that actually they were going to embrace that side of the game and and they did they absolutely did and they took it to them and they were so comfortable in the end in terms of that you know that result. That I think that was a real big turning point because I think it put down a marker to the rest of the league that Liverpool couldn't be bullied now in a way that they could last season. They've always had the quality. They're by far the best team in the Championship. Everyone knows that in terms of the quality. But teams came and frustrated Liverpool last season and made it difficult for them and, mm-hmm. and as I say, sort of bullied them in a way. And that win over Durham almost said to them, you can't even do that anymore. So if you're going to beat us, then you've, you're going to have to beat us by playing football and no other team could do that. So that was that was probably the biggest game of the season for me. Yeah, I think I did the same, I probably did a similar vote to you. Uh, I actually voted for the game after it, the uh, Sunderland away, 
It's mm. by far the coldest game of the season. It's ridiculously <laughs> cold. Um, so I managed to get a, a late lift up to that game. Um, that was a tough game because we went 1-0 down. And this way you sort of think, we've beaten Durham. We, we can't really, we've got to back it up. And it was a live, I'll put it politely, it was a lively atmosphere. Let's put it that way. Uh, but look, there was a flip. There was a switch that flipped in Liverpool at what when they went one 0 down. It was almost like they went into went into serious mode. What I, I I called up on that they went to a serious football team. And they were like, "We're not having this," and it was just wave after wave after wave. You know, not getting a penalty. And then to be fair, we were all expecting at the time Leanne Keenan to score because that's what Leanne Keenan was does. Yeah, and it was an unlikely source. It was Yana Daniels of a header, which you wouldn't yeah. expect because she you, you, she wasn't renowned for getting lots of goals. But yeah. she's developed a nice habit this year of scoring big goals, especially big headers. Uh, and to us, we once we got two one at half time, you were like game over this. That's when you felt it was serious. And then Mel Lowley scores arguably goal of the season. So yeah. I like that one as much. I mean, I love the Durham game because it's Durham have always been that club that I just hate us playing because they're just yeah. always a hard team to play. Uh, but the fact we had to back it up with another difficult away game. That felt like, I think that's where we were. So yeah. they were probably the two for me. I mean, the only other, the probably the, the most I've celebrated a home win was probably the Watford one, where it just yeah. felt like one of those. It felt like one of those annoying nil nil. It just felt like it didn't. Yeah. It? Thinking, it's not happening. It's just going to be. I tried to do the mental math here. Go, oh, this is a nil nil. You know what? How how do we work it from here? Uh, and Katie Stengel, you know, comes on, take your leading goal scorer off in Kieran. I'm just pops up with a with a key goal, which yeah. she, she's got a real good habit of doing now, which is quite a nice trait for a striker. Yeah, and she was pretty new then as well, so it was a big mm. goal. Yeah, it was. It was. So in terms of, I mean, listen, they've all been brilliant and they've all played their big roles, but who've been sort of like key standouts for you? And you can't say Fernie because we know you'll say Fernie for everything. <laughs> <laughs> I actually <laughs> wouldn't say Fernie for this one, as much as I love her. Um, I I do think there's been sort of. Um, three key players for Liverpool this season. Um, one of them has been Rachel Lawes, the goalkeeper. Um, I think she's been absolutely phenomenal. By far the best goalkeeper in the Championship. And I think she'll go up to, into the W Sellers as um, one of the, the best sort of keepers outside of the the kind of the, you know, the top teams. When you look back, do you not think the quite a lot of sides miss a trick there? Because I've, yeah. I've, I've known of Rachel Lawes for, for a while. I'm always surprised she doesn't she doesn't get as much game time as she should have done because she's good she's really good with her feet mm. big saves big presence big personality basically everything you want from a, a modern goalkeeper yeah I mean to be fair I do actually think she's improved during her time at local as well I think when she was at Reading she did have a, an injury sort of I think it was about a year or so before um, or the season before I guess um, she left there. Her contract was coming to an end. I do know that there were other W South clubs that had shown interest um, before mm. Liverpool got her. So, um, yeah, it'll be it'll be interesting to see sort of whether anyone sort of throws their their interest in when her contract's nearing nearing its conclusion at Liverpool. But hopefully, she'll stick around because obviously she is experienced. She might not have the same age on the side that that Riley Foster does, for example, but. She's. I think she's got plenty of years ahead of her, and and as you say, I think she's more than capable of, of you know, of performing to the level she has done in the championship and the WSL. So, yeah, Let's she's hope. definitely been one of one of the key players for me. And then, um, yeah, the other... Let's hope. Let's hope so because you can't imagine Liverpool without her in goal. Yeah, no, absolutely not. So, um, yeah, she's she's got she's got time. She's got time at Liverpool left yet anyway. So, um, and then Kerry Holland um, for me has been. My a massive is. player, and I think she's actually um, still hugely under underrated. Obviously, it was a first full season. She came in in January last season, and she kind of came in as um, and hit the ground running from the off. But she was a, a bit of a goal scorer. She's not scored mm. this season for Liverpool in the league, so she's her role has changed. She's dropped a lot deeper. Um, she's played a lot more as a kind of a um, a pivot type player. Um, I do think she is, she's a box to box and she provides that energy, but I think she's provided a bit more protection for um, the defence, but also she's given the licence to the likes of, you know, Bo Kearns and, and Mel Lawley to some extent almost allowed her to play with a bit more freedom and creativity. 
So, um, yeah, carry Holland for me. And then... Yeah, she's, she's been my... Uh, if you if we do that, she'd be my player of the season. I, yeah. I, I, I call her the engine of the team. Yeah. Because I think that's that formation we play of 3-4-3, three, four, three, four, three, it's a lot of work for the middle. So it's, re it's really hard graph and you see how much they have to do. Uh, I think yeah. I just think it just looks more secure with her in there. I just think she's that key to, to Liverpool, the way she plays. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And I actually voted her for player of the season as well. So, um, but yeah, but then the other third one that I wanted to mention really was, even though I do think she has dropped off in the last couple of games, but I think it's just because she's played so much football, um, is, is Taylor Hines, because I just thought she was absolutely phenomenal, um, sort of in the first half of the season, particularly. Sort of going into New Year, I thought she was Liverpool's best player. Um, and she probably carried that on into kind of February. And then she's, like I say, maybe just the tiredness and the amount of minutes have probably kicked in a little bit over the last month. But I think she's, yeah, she's grown hugely since she joined the club. Um, she did a lot of work in the summer. And mm. uh, I think I think she's got a point to prove when she goes back to, back to the WSL. She didn't really get the opportunities that she wanted to. She lacked a lot of confidence and she seems to have got that back now. So I think she's a player that can really push on with Liverpool in the WSL. But yeah, those three have been my my kind of standouts it's this season. Like I say, there's there's so many. I've not even mentioned our our two strikers who, you know, are right up there in terms of the goal scoring charts in the league. But I just yeah, it's probably those those three for me. Yeah, I mean uh, Taylor has developed has developed a lovely habit of uh, big goals. Yeah. Uh, whether it's with a to be fair, with, with a head, which you wasn't expecting from her, uh, or long distance right footers. So she's yeah. developed she's developed that nice habit of big goals, uh, which is always always nice. Of. The other person I think deserves a bit of a shout out uh, has been Mel Lawley. Um, mm -hmm. I think this has been her most consistent season in terms. I think she's, I think she's second. I think her, I think Fernie's got six assists. I think I think Mel's got five. But you can see the fear she brings into any championship team. As soon as she gets the ball, it's double up or it's or everyone backs a mile off. And when she's got that little bit of a license, license to run at people, she just causes them all sorts of issues. You know, if you're being critical, you would probably like a few more goals from her. But look, that's being yeah. hypercritical when you you're setting up uh, Leanne Kiernan to get twelve, you're setting up Stengel to get seven. You didn't need the goals this year, but I do think she's been really consistent. I think she's probably one of the most exciting wingers in the, in the league, you know, which is credit, credit credit to her as well. And again, I think she's. Probably like Taylor Hines, maybe has a point to prove in WSL level, which would be exciting yeah. to see how she does, actually. Yeah, and I think she's benefited from the players around her as well. You know, the types of players like her and, and Stengel that will make the runs and almost kind of do the extra work that Mal Lawley, probably it doesn't come as naturally to her. I think she has to think a little bit more about her positioning and her, her work off the ball as opposed to, to kind of those players. I think that's bit more naturally drilled into them. But yeah, Mel Lawley sort of enjoys that creative side and almost just having the licence to to run at players. So yeah, no, I think she's quite clearly a player that you get the best out of her when she's enjoying her football and she's certainly been enjoying her football this season. Awesome, awesome. So two weeks then, Sheffield at home, midday kickoff, big trophy lift. Are you, how excited are you? Are you having sleepless nights over when this is going to happen? Well, I'm going to miss it. So, <laughs> oh no, uh, I'm working. It's immense men's side derby that day, and there's a few other Premier League games. So, um, I can't to, get it off. To, you need to roll the BBC <laughs> over this. Well, I've I was lucky even to get the the Bristol game off. So, to be honest, I'm just happy to see to see them win the league. And uh, yeah, don't get me wrong, I'd love to be there for the trophy lift, but I can't I can't have it all. Um, not in my line of work. So, um, I've been really lucky this season that I've got out to to so many games. To be honest, so. Um, yeah, look, I'm excited just for the fan base though, and I'm just excited for kind of the club and the players because I think they just deserve that moment and they almost deserve that kind of release of um, emotions. Um, we sp we spoke to Leanne Kernan after the game at Bristol the other day, and she said that there was a lot of relief at full time in that game just because they've worked so hard to kind of achieve this, and they know it's only stage one, but just the relief of almost. Um, seeing the project coming to fruition in terms of ticking it off at stage one, I think was such a big release for them. So yeah, just for them to have that moment, I just, I, yeah, I, just, I can't wait for everyone. I just think it'll be really, really good. So I'm jealous yeah. of you going, but yeah, yeah. no, 
I can't and wait. There's, there's been a nice thing the club have done actually for the season ticket holders. You know, we've been home and a, home and away is all all fans this year have sat sat in the cop, so behind the goal. But what they are doing, which uh, this will be the first time in three years this has happened, uh, the season ticket holders are going to be allowed to sit in the paddock, so along the edge, which yeah. means we're close to the action, but then you'll be close to the players when full-time hits and you watch a trophy celebration. So I do think the club needs a bit of credit like that. That is a nice little... Because I must admit, I much prefer it when it's on the side because I think you get a better view of the game, but also you're a bit closer to the action. Yeah. Uh, plus, I also nearly keep falling down the cop when we score, which is never a good <laughs> sign when you're trying to be a responsible adult, which I am not doing very well. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm looking forward to that bit as well. And then walk across the road after this and hopefully watch, watch the men be, win the derby. So it could be, as a Liverpool fan, it could be a great day. But listen, this will be my first... Day first trophy lift I'll see live in person for Liverpool. So it's yeah. quite, yeah, just really exciting, you know, and seeing, you know, all the different players we've had there. So it's just, it's going to be a, a nice carnival atmosphere. And look, tickets are still on sale. You know, if you're a season ticket holder or a fan card holder, you get for, you get in for free. You just need to order your tickets. Mm -hmm. uh, I think tickets are £6 for adults, about £3 for children. So look, you can, come if it's your first time, come and come to a WSL game. Uh, well, come watch the side. It's going to be the WSL. And watch your first game for Liverpool and watch them lift the trophy. Can't, you, know, you, you can't have so much more for that for your first game watching the Well, like you minutes. say, that, yeah, they, they moved the kickoff time to midday so fans can get there, watch the trophy lift and get, get back and watch 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 the derby. So, um, yeah, there's absolutely no reason why Liverpool fans you should not do. be there. Yeah, so I'm going to count down for that. So I'm looking forward to that one. So looking a little bit ahead, next season, sort of, what do you think the plans are, um, sort of development-wise, as Liverpool? Because I mean, there is talk they've got a potential site for a training ground, which obviously is not going to be ready for next season. But that's a positive step forward. But do you see the majority of that squad say, staying together? It might be small tweaks, or, or I can't imagine wholesale changes because you think he'd want to give most of those players the opportunity to play the WSL again. Yeah, I mean, well, those the plans for the training facilities have been in place for a, over a year now, um, and yeah, they have they did have a short list of three sites, I believe, and they've narrowed it down to one. So that's yeah, that should be starting to get sort of in place soon. So that's obviously part of the plans. Um, there's a bit more sort of ideas around kind of investment in in staff and um, kind of other training facilities, I guess. Um, simple things like that. Um, working on developments in marketing and things like that um so that's all really good off the pitch obviously they brought in a new women's director in Russ Fraser this season so that's already kind of set the ball rolling and then in terms of on the pitch um I actually do think there will be um probably more changes than I think people might expect I think that's a mixture of a couple of things I think there's there's a handful of players whose contract comes um to the end this this summer um probably ones that might want a bit more game time, um, might be a bit more experienced and therefore probably coming towards the end of what they will feel is kind of their peak time. So um, it'd be interesting to see whether they, they stay on or they, or they choose to go uh, to go elsewhere. Obviously, as you say, there's kind of that blend of experience and young players, but I think Liverpool will want a couple of players who are kind of right in their, in their peak Um in the WSL and that have kind of regular WSL experience. So it wouldn't surprise me if if one or two from kind of both ends maybe leave. So whether that be, you know, a couple of young players go out on loan or whether a couple of the experienced players are moved on. Um, but yeah, I don't think it's going to be wholesale changes. Absolutely not. Um, but I do think, um, well, I'm, I've been told um, both on record and off record that um, there's definitely plans to, to strengthen um, in a, in yeah, at least a couple of areas. Um, I reckon there might be four, four or five changes. Um, I'd be surprised if there was any less than kind of three players. And yeah, and I think if that is the case, then I think you'd see the same amount going out as as there are coming in. Um, so yeah, I think I think there'll certainly be changes. And Matt Beard did actually say um, post match at Bristol, he said that there will be changes in the summer. So. Um, yeah, I know that they've already got targets and they've already been discussing recruitment for a few weeks now. Um, well, for a few months now. So, um, yeah, I think now that we're kind of in an international break at the moment and the players have obviously got the job wrapped up, I know that the staff are going to be working on 
recruitment over the next two weeks before that game at Sheffield United. Um, and this is going to be a really important window for them in terms of bringing those players on board. So, yeah, I think we'll probably know a little bit more maybe towards the end of the season of who might be going and, and who might potentially be coming in. But, yeah, that's my job to try and find out, I guess. <laughs> that's fine. We'll just get you here for an exclusive when you find all this out there for us. <laughs> But obviously, we'll let you we'll let you do it to the BBC first. I suppose you've got to tell them first. <laughs> yeah, I got to do my job. <laughs> <laughs> cool, cool. Well, uh, I think I've took enough enough of your time up now, uh, Emma. So I'll, I'll we'll leave it there. Listen, once again, thanks very much for all your help this season. It's been really insightful, and of course, we'll get you on again for a, a post season chat with Philippa and Neil. So I'm sure we'll have a bit of a party party atmosphere then. Yeah, uh, absolutely. but listen to everyone who's watching. Uh, thanks very much, and don't forget our charity partner, uh, Failacon. Uh, details will be in the description below. Uh, just give what you can to fail. It's a really good charity. So if you can't donate, just like, share, get you known. We are still aiming to try and get to our 10K target by the golf day, which is now in the next, I think it's two months. So do what you can. But until then, Emma, once again, thank you very much. And we'll see you in a few weeks for the latest women's show. Until then, take care. <laughs>